which pronouns. Okay, so what sort of problem is that? Well, in New York State, for example, they've already more or less passed into law the proposition that there are pretty much as many pronoun descriptors as there are people claiming identities. And so on Facebook, for example, which is a good example of, say, common parlance, there's about 71 different gender identities already recognized and no agreed upon lexicon to represent any of them. And so the issue there is, well, what stops the infinite multiplication? And the answer to that is whim. And that's actually written into the law because the law already states that your identity is predicated on your subjective. And I would say whim. And that's also wrong. It isn't. So I was watching Louis C.K. the other night. And you know he's a great philosopher. And uh, he said that if you, and I'm sorry, I don't normally use profanity, but Louis C.K. does, and I am quoting him. And he said, well, if you call someone an asshole, you, they can't actually object because it's not up to them. It's up to someone else to determine if that's the case. Because that, that identity classification is actually a so socially negotiated process. And that's the thing about your identity. The idea that your identity is a subjective construct. It's like, I, and I'm being literally truthful about that, that's what two-year-olds think. And that's why they can't play with others. So two-year-olds are egocentric. And they cannot expand their conception of the world to include the minds of others. They don't really learn to do that till between two and four. And by the way, if they don't learn that by four, they never learn it. And so by the time they're four, what they learn is that your identity is actually a negotiation. It's a negotiation from moment to moment and also throughout the course of your life. So for example, even a child who's pretending knows that. You be the mom, I'll be the dad, we'll play house. You can take on that identity and I'll take on this one. But we both have to agree on what the identity is or we can't play. So your identity is actually part of the public commons and the idea that it's your subjective determination is it's so primordially wrong psychologically that it doesn't even register. So, and the notion, that's already written into the law and that's an absolute catastrophe because in every possible way, developmentally, psychologically, um, uh, philosophically, biologically, it's a completely untenable proposition, but it doesn't matter because it's already written into the law. It's like your identity, it's like your reputation. You think you get to have the reputation you want? Well, good luck with that one. We're so good at tracking reputation that if you, uh, we have an evolved module for remembering reputation, you cheat once, I'll never forget it. And you don't get to object to that. You know, I mean, you can, but that isn't going to change the outcome. And it doesn't change the fact that your reputation, which is certainly a major part of your identity, is something that's dependent on the interactions that you have with other people. To, to, to revert to the notion that that's a purely subjective construct is it's just, I just can't even believe that we're seriously considering that, and much less writing it into the law. I was just going to ask if you could go back to the point about the analogy uh, between uh, the racial slur and the and the. I don't think there's any analogy at all. But that's I think what the difference people between, want to hear. I'm on. talking about compelled speech. There's a difference between saying that there's something you can't say and saying that there are things that you have to say. And I regard these made-up pronouns, all of them, as the neologisms of radical PC authoritarians. Do you understand that? And I don't, I'm not a fan of that sort of person. And the reason I'm not a fan of that sort of person is because I've done my homework. I've read everything I can get my hands on in the development of authoritarian political systems. And I know the literature inside out and backwards. And I am not going to be a mouthpiece for language that I detest. And that's that. And then when the Marxists say, well, that wasn't real Marxism, what it really means, and I've thought about this for a long time, it's the most arrogant possible statement anyone could ever make. It means, if I would have been in Stalin's position, I would have ushered in the damn utopia instead, instead of the genocidal massacres, because I understand the doctrine of Marxism and everything about me is good. It's like, well, think again, sunshine. You don't understand it. You don't understand it. And you're not that good. And if the power was in your hands, assuming you had the competence, which you don't, 
you wouldn't have done any better. And even if you had, there would have been someone else waiting right behind you to shoot you the first time you actually tried to do anything good. And that's what happened to all the old guard who ran the damn revolution. Stalin rounded them all up and shot them, along with their families and millions of other people. So even if you do happen to be that avatar of moral purity that you claim implicitly, the probability that you'd get to act out your goodness in relationship to those possessed by your ideology is zero. Do you have problems in your life that you're not addressing that you could solve? And the answer is yes. And it's an easy thing to figure out. You sit on your bed one morning and say, okay, there's some things that need to be done that I don't want to do, that I could do, that would make things better by the end of the day. What are they? Well, you're your conscience will deliver those suckers no time flat, man. And then you might have to say, okay, well, how do I entice myself into doing a few of those? And if you ask, instead of trying to force yourself to do it like you're a tyrant and a slave at the same time, you can usually negotiate with yourself so that you'll start to sort those things out. Sort them out. Put your house in order. And then move out. Move on. <laughs> and out. <laughs> Yes. That's a Freudian slip, by the way. Yeah. So it's important because the thing is, you, you have a practice domain, right? There are, there are things that are within your grasp that you could fix. Fix them. And you'll learn. You'll learn because it's harder than it looks. Fix them and you'll learn how to fix things. And then something else will beckon as another problem that you could fix. You know. You all have your problems. Well, what does that mean? Like, there's an infinite number of problems in the world. Some of them happen to be yours. Why is that? I don't know exactly. But you have your problems. Great. Solve them. You know, one of the things I learned as a therapist, every therapist has to learn this, is because one of the things you wonder when you're first starting to be a clinician is how do you not take the catastrophes of your clients home with you? And the answer to that is because it's immoral to. They're not your problems. They're their problems. Like, they're, they're their life. You know, your problems are your life. You don't want to solve someone else's problems for them because you take away the, the deep meaning that's to be found in having them work through the problems on their own. And then you steal the credit. Well, I can help you with that. It's like, well, yeah, maybe, but I don't help you with the next problem then. So, in any case, you sort, sort out the problems that are right in front of you. And you will, it will make you grow very, very rapidly. And then you'll be able to sort out more complex problems without making them worse. I'm going to read you something that a graduate student sent me from the University of Toronto the other day. And I, I can also tell you that I've received hundreds of letters like this. Today, I had a tutorial at the University of Toronto where I talked about Jordan Peterson and issues of personal identity, legally sanctioned identity categories, etc. I brought up a video of a tall white man in his 30s who asked students at a university how they'd react if he told them he identified as a woman, as black, as short, and as five years old. Spoiler alert. Students in the video resist some of the later categories a bit, but are mostly accepting. Still, students were not engaging in discussion. I asked them why. One said it was because she was worried to share her opinion for fear of being singled out or saying something offensive. I asked who else was not speaking for that reason. The whole class put their hands up. No participation. Why? They weren't uninterested. They were afraid to speak their minds. I'll start with lawyer one, who was the counsel to several prime ministers. He talked to me about the Human Rights Tribunal, because I went and saw him two weeks after this all started. Human Rights Tribunal is a kangaroo court, in my opinion, and it should be abolished as fast as possible. It's one of the many institutions in Canada that pose a threat to your, to your freedom that, that is of almost unimaginable proportions. Here's what this top lawyer told me. If I'm taken in front of the Human Rights Tribunal, it will cost me $250,000. I will pay the legal costs for my opponents, and I will lose. He said, go back to your safe little life and shut your mouth. It's age old. They're old. Milo is a classic example. He's an amazing person. I mean, he's 
he's a contradiction. He's a walking contradiction. He can't pin that guy down, right? Like, what is he? Half Jewish, half English, gay, uh, provocateur, Catholic, who's a, who's who's really who's yeah, who loves black guys and who 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 is it? Who appeals to American Republicans? It's like, what are you going to say about something? Somebody like that? It's like he's a he's a he's a trickster figure, archetypally speaking, you know, and he's he's a provocateur and a comedian. And the funny thing about comedians, they're like jesters in the king's court. The jester was the only person who could tell the truth because he was beneath contempt. And that's the role that comedians and provocateurs play. They're poking, they're poking, and laughing, and making fun. And, you know, Milo, Christ, he even dresses like a, a, what do you call those, a harlequin. You know, he's a trickster, and trickster figures emerge in times of crisis. And they point out what no one wants to see, and they say things that no one will say. And, you can say all the terrible things about him. He is a provocateur. He's an egomaniac. He's a, he, I don't think he's narcissistic, but uh, because he has some real capacity for self-reflection. But um, and he's brave as can be. I mean, and and he's unstoppable on his feet. He just amazes me. I've never seen anyone ever. I don't think, and I've met some pretty damn smart people. I've never seen anyone who can take on an onslaught of criticism and reverse it like he can. If it's not a him and if it's not a her, what is it? Dr. Jordan Peterson is a professor at the University of Toronto and joins me now because there's been this debate that's been simmering around there, and you're at the center of it, about politically correctness. And some people are saying, well, we don't need to be referred to by that certain pronoun, him or her. But what's the solution? Well, the solution at the moment is mandated use of whatever pronoun someone demands to be referred to by. Now, I, I think when the... Can they suggest anything? As far as I can tell, I, they can, and, and I, I'm not trying to be alarmist about this, but what's happened since the legislation was introduced is that there's been an explosion in gender identity categories. And so, for right. example, in New York now, there are 31 protected gender identity categories. And as far as I can tell, there's nothing in the legislation that stops the, the re, stops there from being a requirement for people to use a different pronoun for every single one of those categories. So, as a, as a professor, and you get a class at the start of the year, does, does someone have to have a sign on them to say which one they well, are, the what they prefer? The practicalities of this are obviously one of the impediments to one of the reasons to for adaptation. the legislation yeah. being, being improperly formulated, in my opinion. I mean, I believe that when, when people were first considering drafting this, they thought maybe there would be 2.1 genders, something like that, you know, so there'd be he, she, and some alternative term which it's, we haven't settled it's on. It's sort of like years ago when it was Mrs., Miss, and people said then, well, we want Ms., but yeah. there's only one Ms. Yes. So there's three categories. What you're telling us now is that there could be 40, there could be more. Well, there's 58 on Facebook. And so what is the administration of the university saying to you when you say, well, this just is unworkable? Well, the, they sent me two letters, one of which was a warning and one which was a more serious warning, stating that what I was, that I, the fact that I was having this discussion was probably illegal under the Ontario Human Rights Code, which is exactly what I made the video about, because I thought it probably was illegal. So I do believe that under current Ontario law, perhaps even the discussion that we're having right now is illegal. And, you know, you might think that that's... that's they are running in here to arrest us right now. Well, we're fine for now. Yes, we're fine for now. But the university took that seriously enough to warn me. And, but, but I also should say that on Friday I went and talked to the dean because they asked me to stop talking about it. And I went and talked to the dean and I suggested that we, we deal with this like civilized human beings and have, a public, and have a debate that the university would host on the issue. And they have agreed to do that. So... So they're going to have a, a public debate. Yeah. Students and every other people can attend and say, okay, what's the solution? Well, I, I don't know if, if the public will be invited to attend, but we're going to have it broadcast on YouTube, live cast on YouTube. I think it's going to be restricted to the university community, but we are going to have a debate about it. So it's not really just you then and the university. What is happening is that the university is saying, we have provincial law here now, which is saying, dictating certain actions on our behalf. Well, I think that they're very concerned about that, yes. They actually thanked me today, the Dean of, of the Faculty of Arts and Science, David Cameron, actually thanked me for bringing this to the attention of the university community. Yeah, he's not a stupid man. No, uh, he's not, and, by, and, no, by no means. And so, I mean, he's sensitive to it, though, but they're saying the provincial law, when was this law changed in the province? Well, I don't know when the... Un Approximately. When, uh, it, it's within the last few years, but Bill, Bill C-16 is the same law at the federal level, and it just passed second reading. And 
so this is law in five provinces already and is about to become national law. And I also should point out that it makes discussion or 